Hello, my name is Tom Keen with the University of Kentucky College of Agriculture, Food and Environment. Today I want to visit with you on introduction to hemp production systems. As with any presentation, I always like to start off with our hemp website. In the upper left-hand corner, you can see our research reports, and that will take you to where you can find the data that we've acquired over the last few years. In the center of the page, you'll see a link to the Kentucky Department of Agriculture's hemp program. In the lower right-hand corner, you'll see a link to our budget models. And if you go to the very lower right corner, you click on this link, you can go to those models, which are very interactive and may help you in determining profit profitability in your particular hemp enterprise. Briefly today, we're going to discuss uh, the history of hemp production in the U.S. and in Kentucky, and then we'll touch a little bit on fiber, grain, and floral production systems. Hemp has been around for a long time. It is native to Asia, and if we look in the history books, we can see that it being mentioned as far back as five to 10,000 years ago. So it's been around for a long, long time. It's been used to make several items that were important in everyday life uh, from then until now. Uh, it was brought to America by colonial Europeans. It was one of the commodities that was recommended for production in Jamestown. And the farmers were instructed to grow it then. They wanted to grow it for what they needed here in the in the new colonies, but they also were required in some cases to send it back to England. So, um, and as you can see at the very bottom, John Rolfe reported that the Virginia hemp compared very favorably to what was grown in Europe at the time. In Kentucky, we see that the first hemp was grown in 1775, again, several years before Kentucky became a state. And as we went forward, uh, Kentucky became known, became known for the quality of hemp that they produced. Uh, Woodford County in 1842 was, was getting over 2,000 pounds of fiber hemp per acre. In the late 1700s, General James Wilkinson gathered a flotilla of boats together to ship down the Ohio and the Mississippi, and the cargo included lots of agricultural commodities such as meat and tobacco, flour, cornmeal, whiskey, etc., and of course hemp was one of the commodities that was on that ship. We've been growing it here in Kentucky again since the 1700s. And really, as it began to take shape, uh, hemp was particularly produced to a large extent by slave labor. I think it's very important that we remember that. Uh, this industry was built on the backs of slaves and William Bullitt from Jefferson County made the comment, if you take away the slaves, you destroy the production of that valuable article that was called hemp. Here is a list of different events and policy decisions of affecting hemp production in the U.S. Again, early 1800s, very high demand, uh, both here and overseas. Uh, in the mid-1800s, cheap imports hurt that. 1865, the Civil War ends slavery. Again, we mentioned how slaves were a large part of the production process. Production did decline. The Tax Act did, did place a tax on it uh, in 1937. However, in 1942, the need for hemp fiber in World War II uh, spurred the Hemp for Victory campaign. If you go to YouTube and look for that, I think you'll find it very interesting to watch that. It's uh, very enlightening about the campaign that helped, helped us win World War II. In 1970, hemp was enrolled into the Controlled Substance Acts, which made it a controlled substance such as heroin, or any other type of thing, cocaine, etc. Fast forward to 2014, the Farm Bill did help resurrect that. The, file, the pilot projects were allowed to come on board. Kentucky was one of the first states to do that. So we were excited about that. And then 2018, December of 2018, the Farm Bill came out, which has been in effect now for about 18 months. And it has changed some things around, but has basically brought hemp back to the forefront uh, in agricultural this is just a chart of the 
uh, states that are growing hemp and how this increased over the years. Uh, in 2020, 47 or 48 states will be growing hemp. We're not sure how many licenses we'll have in 2020 or the number of acres planted, but we can see that every year since 2016, actually 2014, those numbers have continued to escalate. The 511,000 in 2019 is in it's the number of acres applied to grow, the application acres, licensed acres. That is not the number of acres that were grown. Once those numbers are put forth, we'll correct this slide. But again, it just shows you the interest in planting hip around the country has continued to evolve very rapidly as we move forward. When this first got started here in Kentucky in 2014 with the Farm Bill, some of the misconceptions you heard about, uh, people that were talking about it were saying, hemp is a miracle crop. It'll grow anywhere. It'll, it'll thrive on mar marginal soil. It doesn't need fertilizer. It'll outcompete the weeds. Insects won't bother it. Diseases want no part of it. Those were all great, and they were platitudes that in all actuality just aren't true. If we're going to grow this for a commodity crop, we have to be careful about all these things and know that all of, the, all of these play a part in hemp production. We really have three major uses for production systems of hemp here in Kentucky. They are fiber, grain, and floral material. We'll talk a little bit about each one, starting with fiber. Uh, the hemp plant actually contains two types of fiber. It contains the outer layer, which you see on the right-hand side here, the outer stringy fiber. Uh, it's used to make rope and clothing and that type of thing. And then you can see the inner herd fiber or the pithy fiber and the list of components that it, it can be used for. That is a very uh, shallow list, if you will. There are many more opportunities to use this product. But again, it, it, it does have two different types of fibers and multiple uses uh, as we move forward. Fiber production... Uh, it does require relatively low inputs in terms of fertilizer and those kind of things. We can directly seed it uh, through grain seeders that are available to farmers right now. Uh, we use high seeding rates uh, to get you know, good stands and to compete with those weeds. We can mechanically harvest it with sickle bar type mowers or disc bind type mowers. We do not like to crimp it, but we can use those mowers. We're going to bale it, as you can see in the lower left hand corner. Right now, our primary concerns are returns per acre. Again, if you go to those budgets that we addressed in our first slide, uh, you'll see what maybe some of the potentials there are. And when we do the uh, fiber, we're talking about a bulk product where we're going to be getting three, four, five tons of material per acre. We're going to need to ship that to a processor. So being close to that processor to reduce those transportation costs uh, is something we need to keep in mind. Grain production, uh, many opportunities for grain. You can see some of the utilizations that we're having right now. Uh, hemp hearts, roasted hemp hearts, seed oil, protein powders, and those type of things. They're commercially available right now. As we look to the future, we'd like to see that list expand greatly. So our hope is there. Animal feed, right now it's currently not allowed to feed hemp grain to animals. We feel that moving forward, this will change. And if it does, it will create great opportunities for grain production because when we start feeding the number of cattle, horses, swine, poultry, those type of enterprises, uh, we could see a great need for hemp grain production as we move forward. When we're growing it for grain or seed oil production, we do need more modern inputs. Uh, we're going to seed it at a little less rate than we did the fiber. We're going to need more fertilizer inputs, much like we would corn or soybeans because we're producing that grain. Right now, we're able to direct seed that, again, at a more moderate density than we did the fiber. And we do have the opportunity to mechanically harvest it. Again, our potential returns are maybe not where we would like to see them, but we think that they will get better as we move forward. Uh, Dr. Bob Pierce here at the University of Kentucky is working uh, with a group near Louisville on grain production. We're going to be doing some research on that with some farmers 
uh, over near the Louisville area. So we do think there's opportunities for grain production as we move. Lastly, the thing I want to talk about is the floral production. Um, when we talk about the floral production, we are talking about the, unfer the unfertilized female flowers. And from those, we are going to extract the cannabinoids that are found there. Here you can see a list of three, but there are many, many different cannabinoids depending on who you talk to. You can hear that there are 50 up to 100 different cannabinoids found in the hemp plant and or marijuana plant. Um, these have been talked about greatly in the media and in the press of the last six or seven years. And as we move forward, we're not sure which of these are going to be the ones that are going to be most called for. But CBD has led the charge, but now we're hearing research going on with CBC, CBG, CBN, CBA, etc. So as we move forward, this will continue to change, but I do believe that this will be the bulk of production in the very near future. If you've ever been around hemp or marijuana, you know it has a distinct odor. The terpenes within the plant uh, do create this and the stickiness on the plants. Uh, when we're looking at these different cannabinoids, lots of times we're wanting full spectrum, which means they have all the cannabinoids in the product that you're getting. However, we have to be very careful about the claimed health benefits that some people and some companies are making. Right now, that is totally unlawful to make health claims uh, for these products. Uh, a lot of people are using them but we have to be very careful uh, about making those claims. When we're growing these plants for uh, cannabinoid production or floral components, uh, we're looking at uh, transplanting. We want that all-female po plant population that we discussed. Uh, input costs are very high. I won't spend a lot of time going on that. Most all of it is hand harvested. Uh, it's dried in the barns or in different facilities. Uh, at one point in time, everyone talked about the high return potential. However, in the last few years, especially in 2019 with overproduction, those return potentials have uh, lessened quite a bit. Again, just some more uh, inputs on floral components. You can see some of the materials hanging in the barn here in the upper left-hand corner and then some materials being put in a dryer uh, on the slide on the right there on the top. We actually did just a real preliminary drying study last year where we harvested some floral material. We ground it, mixed it thoroughly, and then we air dried some, we oven dried some, and then we freeze dried some to see what effect it would have on both CBD and THC. Uh, the freeze dried did preserve most of the THC, or excuse me, did preserve the CBD and THC the best. You can see that just air drying the material, letting it dry in the air, uh, didn't change our outputs for CBD and THC very much. But when we oven dried it, we did see some reductions in both CBD and THC. Uh, finding this information out, we are now conducting a more comprehensive drying study. Uh, it's ongoing as I make this presentation. Hopefully that data will be available to us in the next few weeks. When it is, we'll be glad to make that available to you. Oftentimes I'm asked if we can grow this crop for a dual purpose or triple purpose crop. In other words, growing it for both the grain and the fiber. Uh, you can do that. It's being done many places. Some people here in the States are doing it. Uh, it's being done in Europe uh, quite successfully. When farmers ask me about this, I always say that it is possible. Uh, you can see a machine here that is actually harvesting the tops of the plants uh, for the grain and then it's cutting the fiber below, very expensive machine. But I tell farmers, you know, it is doable, it is possible, but my recommendation to always pick one of the components, fiber, grain, or floral, and do that the first year, get that first year of growing this plant under your belt. And then if you're comfortable with that, that second year or third year to try to do a dual purpose or triple purpose crop, then by all means do so. But I think it's really important just to get that first year under your belt, picking one component and trying to do it really well as a way to get going in this, in this industry. So that's all I have today. I certainly appreciate your time. It's been a, a welcome opportunity to be before you and present this material. It's a very quick overview. Uh, hemp is a great opportunity for Kentucky farmers. 
and I look forward to visiting with you in future venues as we move forward with this hemp crop. Thank you very much.